Chapter 3 The arrival of a second fighting machine drove us from our peephole into the scullery. Yet despite the terrible danger, the attraction of peeping was for both of us irresistible. We struggled bitterly for that horrible privilege of sight. We would race across the kitchen in a grotesque way and strike each other for a few inches of exposure. I had already come to hate the curate's stupid rigidity of mind. His endless muttering drove me at times almost to the verge of craziness. He would weep for hours. I would sit in the darkness, unable to keep my mind off him. As the days wore on, his lack of any consideration intensified our distress and danger. Much as I loathed doing it, I had to resort to threats and at last to blows. It is disagreeable for me to recall and write these things. Those who have escaped the dark and terrible aspects of life will find my brutality my flash of rage in our final tragedy, easy enough to blame. But those who have been under the shadow, who have gone down at last to elemental things, will have a wider charity. Within the house, we fought out our dark, dim contest of whispers, snatched food and drink, and blows. Outside, in the pitiless sunlight of that terrible June was the strange wonder of the Martians in the pit. After a long time, I ventured back to the peephole to find that the newcomers had been reinforced by the occupants of three of the fighting machines. The second handling machine was now complete. The curate had possession of the slit when the first men were brought to the pit. I was sitting below, huddled up. He made a sudden movement backward, and I, fearful that we were observed, crouched in a spasm of terror. He crept beside me in the darkness, inarticulate, gesticulating. For a moment I shared his panic, but after a little while my curiosity gave me courage. I rose up, stepped across the curate, and clambered up to the slit. At first, I could see no reason for his frantic behaviour. And then, amid the clangour of the machinery, came what sounded like human voices. I crouched, watching the fighting machine closely. As the green flames lifted, I could see the brightness of his eyes. Suddenly, I heard a yell. I saw a long tentacle reaching over the shoulder of the machine to the little cage that hunched upon its back. Then something, something struggling violently, was lifted high against the sky. As this black object came down again, I saw by the green brightness that it was a man. For an instant, he was clearly visible. He was stout, ruddy, a middle-aged man, well-dressed. I could see his staring eyes. He vanished behind the mound, and for a moment there was silence. And then began a shrieking, and a sustained and cheerful hooting from the Martians. I slid down the rubbish and struggled to my feet. Capping my hands over my ears, I bolted into the scullery. The curate, who had been crouching silently with his arms over his head, looked up as I passed. He cried out quite loudly and came running back after me. That night, as we lurked in the scullery, balanced between our horror and the terrible fascination this peeping had, I tried in vain to conceive of some plan of escape. The curate, I found, was quite incapable of discussion. This new atrocity had robbed him of all reason. He had already sunk to the level of an animal. 
It was on the third day that I saw the lad killed. After that experience, I avoided the hole in the wall for the better part of a day. I went into the scullery, removed the door and spent some hours digging with my hatchet as silently as possible. But when I had made a hole about a couple of feet deep, the loose earth collapsed noisily and I did not dare continue. I lost heart and lay down on the scullery floor for a long time. On the fourth or fifth night, I heard a dog howling. Then I heard quite distinctly a booming exactly like the sound of great guns. Six distinct reports I counted, and after a long interval, six again. And that was all. <laughs>